Hi, this is Paul, and this is Rough Draft for Sunday, where I run through the current status of my Sunday sermon. It's the week after Easter, and for the next several weeks, I'm going to be preaching through the book of 1 Peter. I'll talk about that as we get into the sermon. This is a classic optical illusion, and it's the same image, no one would deny that, but people see two very different things in the image. Um, Sometimes people see a young woman. Sometimes people see an old woman. Um, I've looked at this image enough that I can quite easily, consciously, intentionally flip back and forth between them if I tend to focus the center of my consciousness on what would be the left eyelid for the young woman and the right eyelid for the old woman, I see the young woman. And if I focus on what is the ear of the young woman and the left eye of the old woman, I see the old woman. I can just very easily switch back and forth between them. And that's the fact that the world is like that for us is a very important thing. Scott Adams, who uh, does the Dilbert comic strip, talks about two movies. Well, I'm not sure the two movies... Um, that, that tries to get sort of at the same thing. It's one image can look two different ways and to the same person. We can, in fact, flip back and forth from them. What a pandemic like this does is offer a massive disruption to our interpreting functions. Things happen in this world. I often call them Day of the Lord events when suddenly everything is different. And this week I, I did a little conversation with four, with three other pastor friends of mine. And we looked at, okay, what, what has happened in the last month? How is this changing your church? How is this changing your perspective? Six months ago, we didn't think we'd be living like this. Uh, many of us had plans and all of those plans got changed. I moved my daughter out of her college dorm, and my uh, son and daughter are taking college from their laptops from my house in their bedrooms. I never would have imagined this would happen. Some people right now are hypervigilant. They're washing everything. They're very careful. They're staying at home, and everywhere they go, they see, but they don't really see, they see the virus, and so they're hyper vigilant about it. Others are are skeptical. Ah, why listen to this? This is all a hoax. And, and, and these conversations are going to go back and forth for a while. In fact, I was having a conversation with someone talking about the difference between Western and Eastern Michigan. Eastern Michigan, Detroit is exploding with the virus. Western Michigan, it's hardly there. And, and they're looking at one reality, but they're interpreting it in two very different ways. And all of this is over a virus. It's something that we, we don't even know how to categorize it. Is it living or not living? Um, it's nothing we can see or smell or taste, but it becomes very real when you see how it plays out in an individual person's life. Now, this week I've been reading a book by Nassim Talib called The Black Swan. And it's very interesting because I think in America, many of us are sort of sleepwalking in that we imagine that the lights will stay on, the economy will go. Well, there'll be these ups and downs of recession, but for the most part, everything will sort of go as we imagine. But then these events happen that we can't predict. And a couple of sermons ago, I talked about black swans and gray swans and white swans and Talib would would categorize this pandemic as a white swan, not a black swan. But what happens are that, that we have these apocalyptic events. Now, this word apocalypse in our language basically means sort of a disaster end of the world thing. But that Greek word apocalypse is the title of the last book of the Bible, the Apocalypse of St. John. And what apocalypse means in Greek is revelation. It's a disruption of our normal sense-making interpretive patterns and we now see the world differently and that's in fact what the book of revelation is about and is intended to do to its readers but that's exactly what this pandemic has done to us we now see the world differently than we saw it just a few months ago and people are asking with a lot of uncertainty and fear well when will things get back to normal well maybe they will and maybe they won't and how long none of us know
And the point that Talib makes is that the thing that we don't learn is that we don't learn. What did people learn from the 9-11 episode? You know, everybody was, well, let's learn how to avoid people who want to drive airplanes into tall buildings. So we're all set up for that threat. But here this threat comes along and completely unmakes us. He makes the point that every World War I documentary you see, and just prove it, just go out and Google it or check it on YouTube, or the History Channel, the causes of World War I, or the causes of World War II, and they lay out all of these things that led up to the war. Well, why do we do that in our history? Because we like to imagine that we can sort of see what's coming down the road. But Talib's point is that we're really bad at this. Historian Niall Ferguson showed that despite all the standard accounts of the buildup of the Great War, which described mounting tensions and escalating, escalating crises, the conflict came as a surprise. Only retrospectively was it seen as an unavoidable by backward-looking historians. Ferguson uses a clever empirical argument to make his point. He looked at the prices of imperial bonds, which normally include investors' anticipation of government's financial needs and, and, and decline in expectation of conflict, since wars cause severe deficits. But bond prices did not reflect the anticipation of war. In other words, all of the people in 1913 didn't see it coming, but it came. Now in 2020, we look back and say, oh, it was obvious that the war was coming. Well isn't in 2019 it wasn't obvious that covid was coming now we'll all imagine that it's obvious what's going to come next month um maybe to leap's point we don't learn that we don't learn so so what people are doing is you know they're all ramping up to avoid the apocalypse and a bunch of the videos that i make are Pay attention to some of these people that have these vast plans. Well, the apocalypse is going to come from climate collapse or nuclear exchange or economic collapse or the rise of artificial intelligence. And nobody was talking about a pandemic. Not nobody. Some people, again, sort of remember the market crash. It isn't that nobody knew it was coming. There are a few somebodies, but this idea of we, it didn't take the political stage and win the day in terms of budgets and funding and all of those things. And the same is true for the future. There's lots of political and economics mandates around, like, for example, the Green New Deal. But here's the thing. Built into this, how do we imagine the world changes? We think the world changes through vast government programs and wealthy people and important thinkers and all of this. Well, the pandemic changed the world, this tiny, tiny, tiny little thing that none of us can see and we didn't plan on. So how does the world change? Well, people assume that change happens by marshalling government superpowers. But if you look back in history, the biggest event that changed the world, I would argue, is Jesus of Nazareth. He is unique in his capacity to change history. And now this is difficult because where are you standing and what are you looking at? From this point of view, it sure looks like Jesus of Nazareth was the biggest world changer in all of human history. And if you think about that, you might ask, well, what did he do and how did it change? Now, now a lot of the people who are looking at government superpowers are are very skeptical about Jesus' divinity or resurrection. And I would argue that the um, recognition of Jesus' divinity is completely a result of the changes that happened. In fact, N.T. Wright's argument for the physicality of the resurrection, in fact, is based on everything that changed. How could one man who never wrote a book, never killed a man, never let a formal group of more than a few dozen people impact history so thoroughly. Now, we could look at grand schemes and huge populations and all of that, but I think in many ways we should look at individuals. Because, well, a million people die, it's a statistic. One person dies with the TV camera up close, it's a tragedy, and we all pay attention. We are all little centers of the world, 
And stories become powerful when we look at them through an individual perspective. So for the next few weeks, we are going to be looking at Peter. Now, Peter, for a certain portion of the story, is well documented. He was a fisherman. Now, we might think of him as a laborer, but no, he owned the company. So think of him more like a, a small businessman or a tradesman running a small family business. He becomes the lead disciple. He had been following John the Baptist, and Jesus comes along, and John switches. And he and Andrew start following Jesus. And he's probably the oldest of the disciples, and and he's certainly the quickest off um, to make declarations, so not a lot of inhibition in Peter. Um, he declares Jesus to be the Messiah. But then after Jesus is arrested, and then claims that he will go to his death for Jesus... But then when Jesus is arrested and tried, he denies him three times before the cock crows. Peter is also one to rush to the empty tomb. And Jesus and Peter is the one that Jesus says, he renames him Cephas, Peter, from Simon. And then he restores him by telling him to feed my sheep. And it's, it's always interesting to me comparing Peter and Judas because both are wobbly. Why does Peter go through, and Judas fall away. Now, Peter very much becomes the lead disciple, and this is clear at the beginning of the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 2, Peter is the, the preacher at, the, at, the, at Pentecost and delivers this, this magnificent sermon, and thousands are added to their number that day. In Acts chapter 3, Peter and John are going up to the temple, and they heal a they heal a lame man, and, and Peter and John begin to cause the same kind of trouble for the religious authorities that, that Jesus had. And Acts chapter 4 verse 13 says, When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled ordinary men, not politicians or scholars or generals or anything like that, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. And so Peter becomes a very big, in fact, Peter becomes such a big deal that after Paul has his road to Damascus experience, he, he goes to find Peter and to sit down and to listen to Peter's testimony and to learn from Peter in, in many ways. And then there's sort of a divide. Paul becomes the, the apostle to the Gentiles and Peter to the Jews, but it seems that Peter doesn't stick with the Jews because the church is growing by leaps and bounds amongst Gentiles. And that leads sort of to a dispute between Paul and Peter that Paul writes about in the book of Galatians. But what's really interesting is that Peter sort of vanishes from the New Testament story. And we, we don't really have a lot of good information about what happens. He, we know that he eventually makes his way to Rome and becomes the leader of the church there and is martyred by Nero, as is Paul. But the book of Acts pretty much after chapter 9 follows Paul and not Peter. And we don't know what happens. Where's Peter? And so this is part of the reason that we pay so much attention to Paul, because we know more about him. But then towards the end of the New Testament, there's this, this book of First Peter, which is, you know, there's a lot of, lot of debate about it. And actually, this lectionary, which is kind of a standard set of texts that churches all around the world follow throughout the year, that's where we get our, our seasons and our our celebrations, and now we're in Eastertide, so this is the second Sunday of Easter, and there are these standard texts. Well, 1 Peter comes up in this, and, and I like to think of this as a way of understanding Peter probably towards the end of his life. Um, these books of, of Peter are, I think, one way we can think about them are sort of his his legacy books. These are these are summaries of Peter, as quite likely as the Gospel of Mark. But these, these are what Peter left to the church in terms of his witness and his testimony. And so it's, it's interesting to think about it. Now, the book of 1 Peter starts this way. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to God's elect exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now, these are all in areas in 
what would be called Turkey today. And there's a lot of debate as to whether or not Peter went through those areas or knew the people, or if he's sort of doing as Paul did, which seemed to be the practice of, of, of Christian leaders writing to places that they may or may not have ministered themselves, who has been chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through the sanctifying work of the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and sprinkled with his blood. Grace and peace be yours in abundance. That's how Peter begins the letter. And this week we're pretty much just going to look at verses 3 through 9. And I'm not going to preach exhaustively through every verse in the book. We're just going to take some snippets as the lectionary does as we go through the book. And I'll either expand them or not depending on on what's going on. But one of the interesting things about the book of First Peter is it's some of the best Greek in the New Testament. Now it's, it's often the case so, um, that that people would have scribes and and helpers you didn't have word processors and all of this to to help compose a formal letter like this and so the greek is very good in this book and it's it's sometimes new testament greek reads in different ways but part of the challenge of really good greek is that it doesn't necessarily make very good english and so our ideas of sentences, and of course, grammar comes around later to try to define and refine and understand language, which is far more natural and far more organic. Our ideas about sentences are a little bit stymied by this. And so part of the way that that we work through these, these passages is that we try to follow the verbs. And if you compare, for example, the NIV, which is, if you're looking at this on a screen, over on the left-hand side, you'll notice that the way the NIV editors lay it out, well, the first part of verse 3 is a sentence. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ! Exclamation point. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, comma, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, period. But if you look at another translation, this translation comes with my Bible software, and I like this trend. You can't buy it in a book or anything. It's sort of a special one done by the editors of the software. They try to preserve different other things. Every translation struggles to render what can't be done, which is to really translate one language into another. And we do this because we have to, but part of why at least in the Christian Reformed Church, we want our pastors to learn Greek and Hebrew is that we're not completely in the dark in terms of this process. And what's interesting about verses 3 through 9, and part of the reason I picked this particular translation of the Bible, is because it tries to render the whole thing in one sentence, which if you handed this into an English teacher, they would mark it up and say, change this sentence. But we're trying to render Greek here. And, and part of what we do is we, is we follow the verbs. And if you, what I've done in this, in this picture of the text is the main verbs, which are the indicative verbs, are the ones in the little blue boxes. And you notice there's only three of them in this very long sentence, which we would consider a paragraph. And two of them are the same. Rejoice, love, and rejoice. And, and that'll give us a sense of that will give us a sense of what the point of the paragraph is now there's a lot in this paragraph and so what we're going to do is sort of walk through it and I'll do some interpreting as we walk through it but I don't want us to lose our way in all of the other things in the paragraph and to lose what the indicative verbs are telling us about this paragraph because it's rejoice love and rejoice. So so let's let's wade into the weeds. Now it begins, and I'm going to use this Lexham English Bible translation rather than the NIV to walk through because it, they're trying to preserve word order as best they can. And when you see a word in italics, it means that the English editors are sort of filling it in so that it makes sense in English because Greek didn't need that word, but it's pretty much assumed. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, if you're paying close attention, you'll notice we're nowhere near the first 
indicative verb in Greek, but we've had a few of them in English. So, so this is all important, but we're not really to the main point of the passage yet. And what I want us to notice in this is something that we might not notice being egalitarian Americans who all of us are equal and some, some who are perhaps born in Britain who have more ideas of status might know us. But even today, even for Americans, your station and to a certain degree, your destiny in life is determined by the status of your birth. Over the last three years, we've had a lot of talk about immigration and there's immigration and what's called naturalization. Naturalization is making an American out of someone who isn't born on this soil or born to American parents or at least one American parent. Birth is a very big deal in terms of status even today in a country that we don't pay a lot of attention to. And so what Peter is telling his writers is that Via the resurrection, they have new birth. Now, those of you who watched last week's whole service um, on, the, on the Living Stones channel might have noticed that there was a reading from uh, Lord's Day 17 of the Heidelberg Catechism where it's talking about how does Christ's resurrection benefit us. And it had three points. And the middle point is not something that a lot of people might pay attention to. First, by his resurrection, he has overcome death, so that he might, so that he might share in his, so that he might share, make, so that he might make us share in his righteousness he obtained for us by his death. Second, by his power, we too are already raised to new life. That's Peter's point here: that via the resurrection, you have new birth in Christ. And you are given a new status, a new nobility, a new nationality in Christ. When I was a missionary in the Dominican Republic, I, when I'd have to preach at baptisms, and they usually wanted to have the missionary out for baptisms, they were very big deals, I would often talk about, because these were Haitians, most of them living illegally in the Dominican Republic, I would mostly preach about nationality, because that was something that meant a great deal to them, that what they received in baptism is their passport of their new nationality. The kingdom of heaven, in a sense, embraces them by their baptism. They have passed into a new legal standing. Peter continues, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and now verse 4, into an inheritance, imperishable and undefiled and unfading, reserved in heaven for you. Now that word inheritance is important because number one, you don't earn an inheritance. You receive an inheritance by virtue of birth. Now remember, first you were given new birth. Now, on the basis of that new birth, you have for you an inheritance. Here, however, down below in the age of decay where moth and rust consume, any inheritance that you possess in this world is subject to decay. It's subject to economic changes. It's subject to thie where thieves break in and steal. But what Peter is saying is that your inheritance is held imperishable. Now, if you, you look at this word in the New Testament, you'll notice it comes up again and again with respect to the resurrection, that Jesus is raised imperishable undefiled and unfading, reserved in heaven. Now, sometimes we talk about this two-world mythology. Well, this is the this is in heaven your inheritance is preserved, even though you're down here on earth. Okay? Jesus talks about that in the Sermon on the Mount. Store up for store yourself treasure in heaven where moth and rust don't consume. Same ideas. And so what Peter is saying, you've been given new birth. You have an inheritance, and whatever happens down here below in the age of decay, that inheritance cannot be touched. It's being reserved for you in heaven. You who have been protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, if you're following the logic of this argument, 
Again, you have new birth, new status in Christ, and that new status affords you an inheritance, and it's imperishable outside of the age of decay reserved for you. Now, N.T. Wright makes this point often. A lot of Christians imagine, well, I'm going to go up and be united with my inheritance, and that's not a bad way of talking. But the New Testament usually uses different language because that inheritance will actually be revealed in the last time. Well, what do they mean by that? It will come into reality in the day of the Lord, in the last time, in the consummation. Now, if you've been following my my videos, you notice that I play a lot with this day of the Lord imagery because that's sort of apocalypse. That's sort of revelation. And, and that idea Peter is going to play with here as well. All right? Now, all of this is given before the verb. And some of you might remember the first verb because there's only two of them three times. Rejoice, love, rejoice. Well, before the verb, this is all of the condition by which we meet this life. In which you rejoice greatly. And, and so what, what, what Peter really does is position and posture the Christian and say, this is your posture in this world. This new birth, this inheritance preserved for you that will be revealed at the last day. This is all what you know. And this is all before he comes and says, now rejoice. Now rejoice. Oh, but we Americans like to rejoice when times right here and now are good. Peter doesn't say that. He says, now rejoice greatly. Although, and you notice they put that little word in, it's assumed, now for a short time, if necessary, you are distressed by various trials. So not only is all of this teaching about your new life in Christ assumed, right now, if necessary, you will be distressed. Rejoice, although you're distressed. And this is part of why I wanted to focus on 1 Peter, because what some of us are feeling in this pandemic is exactly what Peter is addressing. So that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold that is passing away. See, here's the crazy thing about gold. Gold doesn't tarnish, and that's why gold is often used by religious to make statues and idols and imagery and icons. And gold is often used because it doesn't tarnish. And he says, this thing that you have is more durable than gold. Gold, although it's passing away, but is tested by fire, gold is purified by fire, may be found to result in, again, little words added, praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We'll get to that last part in a minute. In the midst of this now, and not yet, and the, the wheat and the tares mixed together, because all of this is given, and it's given for you to see, but you can't really see it because it hasn't arrived yet. Right now, everything is chaotic. And, and in a sense, this teaching is bringing order to it. And, and you're trying to put this together. Trials are revelations. They're the apocalypse of what is true. And, and so that's exactly how trials function. In, in that, well, the trial puts you in a space where you don't know the outcome. But it's the outcome out of that mixed upness out of that chaos that actually becomes the revelation just as gold is tested to be refined and it doesn't come until the goal comes the celebration of that goal of all the effort of the hero has been achieved it's the it's the buzzer winning basket it's the it's the goal that carries the day that may be found um, that you may be that may be found to result in praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ at the apocalypse of Jesus Christ. And if you're sensitive to this language, you'll 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 notice that it's actually deeply mythological, and I don't mean that as as make believe, but it's it's taking it's messing with time. Because right in the moment of trial, 
the entire world comes together in that moment. And that's what Peter is saying. Who, although, talking about the hero now, who, although you have not seen, you love. In whom, you, in whom now you believe, although you do not see him. And you rejoice greatly with joy, inexpressible and full glory, obtaining the goal of your faith, the salvation of your... Now, it says souls, and that's a perfectly good word for suke, but also selves is a perfectly good... You're, you, the you, the, the real you, the you down in, the you that is that you're dying to know, the you that you're striving to be, the rescue of you comes through this process. So Peter is saying just in this one sentence slash paragraph, it's the same picture and two perspectives. When you watch a movie, someplace in your heart, you know it will be good and end rightly, at least if it's a Hollywood movie. Someplace in your heart, you but but yet in the midst of the movie, you 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 you, you but it's right there in that dynamic that the movie is good, because a movie that says I drove to the store and bought my milk and got home safely is no movie anybody wants to watch. All stories involve some trial in the middle, and Peter is is lining up for you the story and saying, new birth, inheritance preserved outside of the age of decay, rock solid, better than any investment you could find here in the world. All of that. So rejoice, even though you're in the middle of the adventure right now and, and you're looking at the world in two ways and you don't really quite know what is what. The best movies push you to the limits of your capacity to not give up hope. And, and in fact, usually when we turn off the movie, it's because we can't stand it anymore and, and we give up. But and that's in a sense what sometimes suicides are. But the resurrection affords the second hopeful vision. We are given a new status that has been rewarded. You are sons of God. Well, what does that mean? Well, it's not really a gendered comment because in the first century, it's a historical legal metaphor by saying you are heirs you've been given new status at new birth and you are heirs of god in christ use your status as the son of god a little later in the book we'll hear the living stone had christ's resurrected body is your promise now time wise we're in the middle of the game Humpty Dumpty is in midair. The heat is on the gold. We are watching to see what apocalypse will reveal. And, and this comes to us individually when the crisis comes to our life. And will we rise or will we fall? Now, we might, now Peter knows this because Peter has failed. <laughs> and, and you think, well, only super Christians never fail. No, Peter, who's, this is Peter's story. Peter denied him three times and was restored. So this is not a story of perfectionism. But it is a story of we're in the middle of the game. And we don't know. We, 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 part of us knows how it will come out. And, and that's what Peter's trying to say. But another part of us is right there in the middle. And the heat is on the gold. And I talked about Humpty Dumpty in last week's sermons. Humpty Dumpty is in midair. And we are watching to see what apocalypse will reveal. The revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's part of that story that grabs our attention. And draws our focus. And brings us into the game. And he says, don't despair. And, and I get that from the Lord of the Rings because that was Tolkien's point in that. And it's the love-hate drama of the best adventures. Sam notices this. And, 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 and what place will, will Golem play in this? What will be revealed? Who will play that part? What part in the climactic destruction of evil? And so I include here in this picture this, this haunting Renaissance painting of Peter's crucifixion upside down. And, and and someone might think at that moment, was that his trial? Yes. But but then the trial of Jesus and the crucifixion of Peter 
it all comes together in that because Jesus went to crucifixion first. And so Peter goes into crucifixion with all of the terror and fear. And, and, and he had denied him before when the heat was on. And, and Peter, who said to Jesus, I will stay with you no matter what comes. And then Peter, under the withering of being sarcastic, investigation of a slave girl says, I never knew him. The trial is on. What will come out of it? It's the whole thing that Peter brings to us and says, it's, it's the new birth and it's the inheritance and, and that's all there. But now for a while we suffer. So rejoice, love, rejoice. That's where we're at. I love this section that I found when I was working through John before the before the, the Lenten season where, where out of this, this testament of the patriarchs, there's this image where I saw in the midst of the horns a virgin wearing many colored garment and from her went forth a lamb and on his right, as it were, a lion <laughs> and all the beasts and all the reptiles rushed against him and the lamb overcame them and destroyed them. Right there it is. All of this stuff that the pictures that, that when we look at the picture, we can't we can't tell. It's all muddled together. And Peter says, follow that lamb wherever he goes. Will you follow a lamb into battle? What kind of battle? The battle where the lamb is slain? The battle where Peter loses his life? The battle where the apocalypse lands and we don't know what comes? Peter says, yes. Follow that lamb wherever he goes.